Welcome to Cruising Kitsap. I'm Samantha McGuire. I am so excited to be starting today's show in Port Orchard, the town where I live. As you can see, it's a beautiful day and we're sure enjoying it from the observation deck located at the Port Orchard Marina. Kitsap County is rich with history that makes up our beautiful Pacific Northwest. Old logging companies, tile, and terracotta companies help to contribute to the area's growth. Join me today as we explore more of our area's history. Today we're going to explore some history and how it's helped shape the area we call home. Museums, like the one behind me, give us an understanding of our history and a glimpse back through time. 416 Sydney Street in Port Orchard is now home to the Log Cabin Museum. The Log Cabin was built in 1914 and is now run by the Sydney Museum Arts Association, a nonprofit organization started back in 1970. We're inside the Log Cabin Museum, and sitting here with me is Mary Peterson, director of the museum. Hi, Mary. Hello. Welcome to our log cabin. Oh, thank you for being on the show. This is such a gem of a museum. Can you tell us a little bit about it? Yes. It was built in 1914 by Alan Bartow. Mr. Bartow had retired from the Civil War, had been a newspaper man, and was a retired agent for the Suquamish tribe. His wife Louise had always wanted a log cabin, and in their travels they were never able to have one. So when he retired, he built her a log cabin on this original site. That's lovely. Now, the terrain of this site is crazy. It's so steep outside. How the heck was this log cabin put here safely? We don't know why exactly it was built here. There's no backyard. It goes straight down into the ravine. When it was built, the fir trees out back would have been shorter and there would have been a beautiful view. But there must have been other property available in Port Orchard in 1914, and, and we're not sure why they chose this spot. Now, the cabin has had many owners, and actually at one time was due to be condemned by the city of Port Orchard, and that's when SMAA took over it. Can you tell us a little bit about the acquisition and how that came to be? Yes, uh, SMAA, Sydney Museum and Arts Association, is made up of local volunteers whose goal is to preserve history in the South Kitsap area. The cabin had been lived in off and on up until the 60s. It then fell into disrepair. It was without a tenant for uh, a decade, and the local fire department condemned it. They were going to use it for burn practice. At that point, the Sydney Museum and Arts volunteers uh, were able to purchase it. They brought it back to its former glory, and it's been a museum for over 30 years now. Tell us a little bit about the repairs. Um, that must have been quite an undertaking. Well, the northeast corner of the home was originally balanced on a big cedar stump and that rotted away so we had to put in a foundation that was a little more practical than a stump. The fireplace uh, was redone. It still works. We have a fire in it for Christmas when we have Santa here. The roof was redone in 1970 and we are in the process now of raising money to have it redone again. There's a family of mannequins <laughs> amongst us here and I know they play a huge part in the exhibits. Can you tell us about the orchard family? Yes, this is our mythical orchard family. They live here in the cabin, and we use them to pr portray different eras that uh, they would have lived in, in in Port Orchard in the early days. We have had mannequin weddings where we invited the general public <laughs> to the reception, and many people came. We've had a mannequin funeral when oh one of our uh, soldiers returning from World War I uh, succumbed to the results of mustard gas. We have, uh, in the kitchen, we have Teddy, who's the littlest boy, who's always in trouble. We have Amelia, the mother, uh, Emily, the little girl, and right now we're in 1913, and the men at the table are comparing notes about their fathers and uncles being in the Battle of Gettysburg 50 years previously. 
I understand that the City Museum and Arts Association is seeking historical status for the Log Cabin Museum. I did some calculating and it's been here almost a hundred years. So what is necessary to get the National uh, Registry going? Can you tell us about that? A lot of paperwork. We were able to secure National Historic Status on the Sydney uh, Gallery, which was the original Masonic Temple and was built in 1906. And it just involves going through every inch of the facility, describing what it's made out of, when it was made, who lived here, uh, proving that we have original siding, original, the original logs. Uh, it's a cumbersome process, but we learn a phenomenal amount about the building. So it's, uh, it's an education for everyone involved. Wow. Well, thank you for all of your hard work. The museum is just a delight to see. And when can um, our viewers come and see the museum? Our uh, museum is open on weekends, May through September. It's open the first two weekends in December. And it's open by appointment at any time. If they call the Sydney Gallery, they'll get a phone number. And we will open it. There's no charge. We love to show it off. That's wonderful. Now something special happens here in December and I just wanted you to tell viewers a little bit about that while we have a chance. We have Santa Claus here and we have a fire in the fireplace, we have vintage ornaments on the tree and people come bring their own cameras, take their own pictures and there's no charge. We've had families that are coming from a far, as far away as Portland and third generations of oh, wow. families are having their picture taken here with Santa. And it's okay to bring a pet, isn't it? It sure <laughs> is. We've had dogs, goats, and iguanas. Oh, goodness. <laughs> Mary, thank you so much for being on the show. We appreciate your time and all of your knowledge. And viewers at home, get out here on the weekends and come check out this gem of a museum right here in Port Orchard. For more information, Mary, what should they do? They can go on to our website, which is sydneymuseumandarts.com, or they can call the Sydney Gallery, which is at 202 Sydney. We'd love to have people meet our family here. Holsbo's first Marine Science Center was started in 1970 by two high school teachers. It was located in the old oyster and codfish plants on the shores of Liberty Bay. Eventually, the Polesville Marine Science Center moved here to 18743 Front Street. Education is the focus as the aquarium provides a look in the world of sea creatures below the water's surface. Holesville Marine Science Center with Patrick Muss. He is the aquarium director. Thank you for being on the show today. My pleasure. The Holesville Marine Science Center is really a hands-on sort of place um, for children and adults alike. Can you tell us a little bit about the educational programs that you offer? The educational programs revolve during the school year. We re out do outreach to schools. So we have Central Kitsap, South Kitsap, North gets that Bainbridge Island come in and they'll bring a busload of 60 kids and 30 will be in the classroom. We have a, out on the dock, we have a floating lab. Oh. So half the kids will be in the classroom and the other half will be on a floating lab and midday they swap out. And it's grade dependent. So if third graders come in, they have a specific item they're looking at. Fourth graders, fifth graders, up to sixth graders. Oh, that's wonderful. And it also fits along with their curriculum that they're doing in school. Okay. Now what's the difference in the water that is out in the bay versus inside the aquarium? Is there a difference? A big difference. Okay, can you tell us yeah. a little bit about that? You want the chemical components? No, um, <laughs> the water inside the bay, we chill our water. We also filter our water. Uh, we keep it at a constant uh, 50 degrees to um, slow down the metabolism of the animals oh. so they don't produce a lot of waste and so they're not a lot, eating a lot of food. So it kind of gives them an optimum living habitat. Interesting. It's also filtered through sand filters and, and biological filters that sit up above the tanks 
to get out the nitrates, the nitrites, the ammonias, and also introduce oxygen into the water. What is the process to bring creatures into the aquarium oh, from the outside? That's a big process. Um, I and one of our other volunteers, or a couple of the other volunteers, go out diving. And so we go out collecting things. Um, and it's, a, um, it's not target specific, not unless we're looking for an octopus. Oh. So we'll go out and I'll find a whole bunch of sea cucumbers or a whole bunch of burning anemones. And um, in my mind, I kind of know what population count is of, of all the animals and all the things. So I'll know what we need. And then I'll pick up what we need. And then I'll, we'll bring them back in, in a cooler. We'll drive back from wherever we get them and um, put them in the water. Uh, acclimate them to the water and bring them in. Oh, wow. Interesting. Speaking of octopus, <laughs> we have one. You have a very, very large one uh, outside. outside right? yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's something significant um, to the Science Center. Can you tell us about that? Well, um, the impetus of it was at one time we had a tree out there. The tree had some issues with it. So the tree had to be taken out. And so we had to come up with something to replace it with. A gentleman by the name of Bill Austin does a lot of stuff around Polesbo, and he knows the artists that built the octopus that also did all the rock work in here, the gunite work in here. So he contacted him and they came up with a scheme, an idea of how big, what color, what size, and, and, and they brought it down one day in a flatbed truck. Oh. <laughs> and it was offloaded on a, um, via a articulated forklift, and then we set it in a sand pit. And it's okay for children to climb on oh, it. Oh, yeah, it is. <laughs> as long as they're not writing anything on it, it's fine, yeah. Uh, let's see, the Science Center is open Thursday through Sunday. 11 till 4. 11 to 4. It's free to come in. We ask for donations. Um, the, another, the another impetus behind that is it's going like going to the library. You don't pay to go into the library to learn. So people don't pay to come in here to learn. We have... 40 some odd docents that are versed in all the creatures we have in here. And so they share their wealth of knowledge to the visitors that come in. Well, it's really a neat place. And I recommend to our viewers to, if they haven't had a chance to come down and the exhibits are always somewhat changing because of the different sea life. So wow. if you have been in the last year, come down again this year, right? right? We do have a giant Pacific octopus. It's very small right now. And it'll end up in that tank probably, I want to say, in about a month, I'll put it in there. It weighs about mm, a half a pound right now, so it has to get some girth to oh, it. Oh, goodness, before it's a I little put it baby. In it's very, well, it's about nine months to a year old. Oh, wow. Oh, small. Yeah. They um, have, when they're in the platonic stage, it takes them a while to get large enough to settle out, to settle to the bottom. Oh. And then it takes them a while to get enough girth on them, or growth on them, to... Um, scavenge, you know, catch food and stuff like that. And then once they get to a certain age, they just blossom, wow. grow at a rapid rate, really, really rapid rate. Will you have that octopus here for a while so that um, people that oh, are wow. coming into the Science Center can watch it grow? We'll use, we usually keep them between six to nine months. Okay. And then we release them oh. back into the wild. And how long does it take from, you said that the, the octopus now is six weeks? Months. Six months. Well, no, it's no, it's about nine months old. Nine months. All right. So, how long does it take from, uh, you know, right now a half a pound? I imagine isn't that big. So, how long does it take to actually get into a what we, we would consider a full-grown octopus? Full-grown octopus varies. The weight can vary between. We've had them in here 65 pounds, 70 pounds, down to maybe 40 pounds. Oh. So it'll take between another six to nine months to get them to that size. Okay. We've had one in here that was, the first one we got, Mr. Bob was, and that's his name, the one out front. <laughs> it was about 12 foot across. Oh, wow. From tip to tip tentacles. And it wow. was a male. And the reason why we release them is so they only live four years, three to four oh. years, and they only mate once. Okay. And after they mate, they go into a state of, um, of not wanting to eat and stuff like that, so they just die. Oh. So it's better to let them go and let them give them a chance to mate and reproduce and I see. keep the chain going. Yeah. 
What are some examples of what people can expect to see when they come here to the Polesville Marine Science Center? Well, they can come in and they'll, of course, see the tide pool tank that we're sitting on. Um, and that has sea cucumbers and fish. And then they'll see the Octopus Museum and we have a tank in the back that has a piling in it. And we also have a warm water tank and across, directly across from it is a cold water tank. And the warm water tank is tropical fish. And the cold water tank is a, obviously cold water animals. Um, and kids, and, and we try to compare and contrast and show people the difference between warm water and cold water. Um, cold water has much more life in it. it, has the ability to carry much more oxygen in it, so it's more productive than warm water is. Well, thank you so much for being on the show, Patrick. We thank appreciate you. your time. Okay. and. Thank you for all your hard work you put in here at the Marine Science Center. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you.